is a pass. Clerk, please, uh, committee, please come, to the district board, please come to order for the meeting of June 5th, 2023. Um, clerk, read the roll. Debella. Here. Adel. Here. Anderson. Here. Avedesian. Here. Pisano. Buell. Here. Bush. Here. Curry. Here. Desai. Here. Drake. Here. Gale. Gardo. Here. Gentile. Here. Keeley. Here. Hoffman. Here. Hoheb. Here. Holloway. Here. Johnson. Here. Lachance. Lester. Here. Lewis. Here. Magnan. Here. Mandike. Here. Maniscalco. Payne. Here. Patel. Here. Potowski. Salemi. Here. Stuber. Here. Taylor. Here. Torres. Wolf. Here. Carrier. We have a quorum. Stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Approval of the uh, minutes of uh, May 1st, 2023. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved and seconded. Are there any additions or deletions? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Um, re item six, no report from the chairman. We have the chief executive officer. Uh, number, number I'm sorry, number five, public comments. Public comments. Item six, uh, report from the district chairman, no. Uh, item seven, report from the chief executive officer. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Scott Jellison. Um, so I'm only, I've only got one item, and I'm going to try and be brief, uh, but it's a very important item we've been talking about really since uh, uh, late January. So as you know, just uh, a little bit of history. Um, uh, the board remembers we spent literally six years developing the latest long-term control plan. We refer to it as the integrated plan. It was submitted in December of 2018. All of our towns supported that. It literally took f almost four years to get that approved from DEEP. So re we received it in uh, September of 22. The, our board approved it in December of 22. Uh, in January, um, we, uh, or during that time frame, we were talking about the concept of our uh, customer base that um, is not getting a benefit uh, uh, to the clean water product. Clean water product truly was focused on on CSOs and SSOs to the river, and so the majority of the money that was being spent was being done to to address those issues. And if there was a benefit within the community, it was it was not the intended benefit, but it was a side benefit to to the what we had proposed. The goal was to achieve one year level of control everywhere out through the district and eliminate eight SSOs throughout our seven other towns, not Hartford, and to eliminate the overflows to the Wethersfield Cove and eliminate, eliminate the overflows to the North Branch of Park River. That was our goal. That was the requirement. That was the quote $4 billion project, right? We spent $1.6 billion to date. In our conversations over the last number of months, we started talking about uh, it's the right thing to do. Why don't we propose, and we have an ordinance that's proposed, we had a public hearing through BPW, we had proposed, uh, let's use some of the um, nine million dollars that we collect every year um, from the customer service charge on the sewer side, and let's use that money to actually replace laterals for free for everyone. And in that conversation, um, we started having these, uh, we had the, the storm in, in November of 21, uh, we had, I'm sorry, August of 21, we started having uh, issues re, uh, being raised in North Hartford uh, with DEEP and EPA about the fact that the MDC is responsible for street flooding and, 
as I've said before, that's not true, but um, that morphed into a much bigger discussion with Deep and EPA uh, and, and, and with the community about really what does the Clean Water Project do. And through that process, uh, kind of like I use Lindbrook, Lindbrook was an example that West Hartford people started to realize that, oh my God, it's the stormwater we're creating within our own town that's causing the problem within our own town. The North Hartford and others started to realize that the Clean Water Project doesn't really, and it really is intended to address street flooding or, you know, surcharging in, 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 uh, in basements. And so we started having conversations with DEEP and we started to see, they asked us what we, would we recommend uh, to do uh, immediately starting this summer that would actually produce a, a benefit to the community and instead of the river. And DEEP was willing to consider pushing off those projects that would benefit the river in support of the community. So ever since then, we've been working diligently because you know the commitment was we want you to start work this summer. Uh, the other problem, what we set as a, as a guideline, MDC, uh, was we do not want to charge any more than you, all of our towns, had supported under the integrated plan, which was approved in December of 22. And that was a rate structure for the clean water surcharge. It, we do not want to exceed that rate structure, right? Uh, we don't want to try and provide a benefit to North Hartford and then have the people from North Hartford pay more. That, does, that doesn't make any sense. So the chairman, myself, Chris Stone, all of us supported that. That's not an option. So we had to do a lot of work in a very short time frame to, to solve some of these challenges um, and get deep to understand uh, why what our proposals are would actually benefit the f in, in the future. So we're changing the mindset of deep, which is wonderful. We're changing the mindset of the regulator. We're starting to get them to understand why build big infrastructure, collect the overflow at the river to protect the river. Why don't we simply go into the community, take the stormwater out of the community, meaning from the homes, from the streets, and then there will be theoretically no overflow. Makes sense, right? Problem is it takes longer. So in all of these discussions, DEEP and EPA have been willing to consider it taking longer. So our goal is, but we already made a commitment to our communities that we're only going to charge X. And we're not going to exceed that. So what I'm going to present to you tonight, you've already seen this. The scope hasn't changed. Uh, we've already submitted this a number of times to, to, to the commissioners. The, the challenge was how do we get there without increasing the rate? So just quickly, um, this is the long-term control plan, integrated plan that you all have approved. And this was basically, the good news is even when they approved it in, in September of 22, the new regime, the, the, um, the new staff uh, leadership at, at DEEP recognize that let's not focus on what we're going to build in 20 years from now. Let's just focus on the first 10 years. So the good news is, even prior to this discussion, we agreed to look at phases. So phase, a 10-year phase. So let's, what can we do in 10 years? So this is what we were planning to do in 10 years. And this is obviously the, 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 the south okay. tunnel that we're building now. This is that drainage study area we've talked about. We need to do a drainage study because the way in which we eliminate the overflows here to the north branch of the Park River is through separation. So we need to do a drainage study. And um, so that's going to, we started that. As you know, we did the MOU, MOU with the city of Hartford. Uh, we're working on that as we speak. Um, and that's a lot of work, a lot of design work. Uh, we have to put flow meters in the sewer pipes to, 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 to meter how much water is coming from where, how much storm water, or dry day, wet day, all those good things. So that's why we couldn't do separation um, in, in these areas uh, because we need to do the drainage study first. So the question was, what can you do? So what we proposed, so this was the original work that was proposed. What we have proposed is to do something different, just like we said. In these areas that are shaded, you've seen this before, we're proposing to do something that uh, wasn't part of the integrated plan. 
So these shaded areas represent, we call it rehab. So rehab means we're aligning the sewer and we're gonna fix any point repairs before we line the sewers. Um, but this was not the initial intended work to achieve the goal of the, of the deep long-term control plan, the one-year level of control. Um, we also were not planning on doing any private property work. So now we're proposing in these areas to line the sewers, in addition to the separation that we're gonna do, to line the sewers and do the private property work because we have proven over time doing pilot work in Wethersfield, Bloom, um, sorry, Wethersfield, West Hartford and Hartford, that when you line the lateral on the home, you actually can achieve 30% of the goal of eliminating the stormwater that's flowing into the system. So DEEP traditionally won't pay for private property work. They traditionally won't pay for, uh, they only pay 20% for, for this kind of lining of the main in the sewer because they never felt it was um, the right way to spend the money. They felt collecting it at the river was the, was the most cost-effective way to achieve the goal. Then we also talked about uh, there's areas that, these blue dotted areas that we can actually do some separation quickly this summer as long as we could get deep to jump through some bureaucratic hoops because we need to use, we can't bid this work, we'd never get it done in time. So we're gonna use our on-call contractors to do this work. DEEP has agreed to that. We've gotta make some changes to the contract language to make sure we comply. We're also looking to add in all of these areas, all of the private property work we're adopting. It's a goal, but we've adopted the city of Hartford's uh, uh, language where we're trying to co comply with 30% Hartford residency uh, workforce. So we don't typically do that. We typically comply with the state requirements of uh, you know, the small business DAS, but we're actually gonna comply, try to comply. Uh, we're working very hard uh, to, to just build capacity within the system for contractors to do backwater valves in private property work. Uh, so we're gonna focus on, um, you know, the 30% goal will be that all the workers on these project areas will, ha we will be Hartford residents. Um, and uh, so that, again, that's very different. We've never done this before, but DEEP has agreed to it because it's on the private property side. They wouldn't let, it, let us do that on the, on the, the street stuff uh, right away, but they're allowing us to do it in the private property because it's a different fund of money. They will not let us use clean water fund, fund money for the private property work because they can't. Uh, they're using a different uh, pot of money, um, but they have agreed to give us um, uh, grant money for that work. Now, the, the, the other, we're also, in addition to that, we were planning in this general area under this phase one of doing one large separation project. We call it uh, uh, Granby 7. We've actually taken Granby 8 and 9 and we've dumped it into this phase one. So we'll do more separation uh, in, in this area than we were planning in this first 10 years. And again, the goal is not the river. The goal is to benefit the community. Um, so all of this um, has, a, has, a, has a consequence, right? You can't, we can't, this represents about $150 million worth of work that we weren't planning to do in phase one. We all approved, this board approved, our towns approved. Here's our affordability, here's what the rate structure should be, here's what we're gonna do. It took us six years to plan this out, and now we're trying to plan out a new plan in months, right? So how do we do that? Well, the answer is uh, you need to give us more money. And the answer was we don't have any more money. We only have X. So we, through that discussion, we said, well, listen, uh, two issues. One, th he's a, these are large projects that are really designed kind of like the tunnel. They're designed to expand the size of the pipe to accommodate the additional stormwater. It's the complete opposite of what we just got talking about. We want to get the stormwater out. So the answer is, why don't we hold off on these projects? Let's replace our infrastructure, the existing infrastructure. Let's do the private property work before we start building bigger pipes. And that's kind of the logic of what the original long-term control plan was. Build bigger pipes, collect the overflows at the river. So we're getting away from that, so why not do, uh, start here? 
Now this is an example of um, a really important one, which is the, um, oh, where's my, Where's my, uh, where's my, where's my, Co. Contract four. Oh, right here. Yeah. Contract four. This is an important one, right? So we build this big tunnel to collect overflows that go to the river. And there's components to it, right? There's five contracts. And, and, and all the contracts together make one and you achieve the goal. So the tunnel, the reason why we went to the tunnel in the first place was because we had an issue with Deep, and Deep says you have to eliminate the overflows to the Wethersfield Cove. And we said, well, it's not really fair because in 2004, we agreed that elimination was defined in a document, 2004 documents, defined an elimination means an 18-year storm, not elimination. And we fought with them for a long time, 2010 to 2013, and they said, nope, elimination is elimination. So that cost about $150 million more. We had to make the tunnel bigger. We realized that separation on Franklin Avenue was impossible to achieve the elimination, the new definition, and therefore, we were gonna have to build a bigger tunnel. And that's what happened with building the North Tunnel to the, uh, to, to the north part of the city, which we removed. Um, so in all of that, we said to Deep recently, we said, with all this discussion about doing <coughs> separation to achieve the goal, private property to achieve the goal, why don't we simply, instead of spending $120 million to build more conduits to dump CSOs into the tunnel, why don't we think about phase two, spending $120 million on Franklin Avenue and separate Franklin Avenue, achieve the same goal. Achieve the same goal environmentally, but also this infrastructure that needs to be replaced. So let's do that. So they agree in concept and they have agreed as part of the schedule to push the downtown tunnel to 2058 and they've agreed to push these projects for 10 years. So these projects here, so the way in which we get that uh, rate structure to be close to what we originally uh, sold the, the community on was to push that, push those 10 years. Now the problem is that's, that doesn't do it. It's still the, the, the um, again, we're spending $150 million more than we were going to. So even pushing those projects still doesn't do it. That still doesn't solve the financial affordability of our community, right? And the answer, the chairman and I, Chris Stone, we sat in front of, at the legislature and said, we drew the line and said, we're not going to propose something that raises the rate for any of our customers. So this just highlights the, the projects and, and the 155 million, the 77 million. So, you know, the, the discussion early on with Deep was, and it was a great discussion. It wasn't, I mean, it was a little tentious, but, but it, was, it was a good one. The answer is, but we're giving you $77 million in grant money. And I said, that's wonderful, but that's like giving me a $10 million house and you pay in $5 million of the mortgage, but I can't afford the other five. So what good is it, right? So yeah, you're giving me 77 million, but I gotta come up with the other 77 million. And who's paying for it? The people in North End of Hartford. North Hartford, excuse me. North Hartford's paying for it, just like everybody else is paying for it. And then the problem comes in that everyone else that the other seven towns would expect, and I would expect, if we're gonna give free laterals to everyone, like we started talking about um, last year, then every, every home should get a free lateral because it has the same benefit. It actually provides a better benefit, and we're going to prove that to the regulators, than what they had wanted us to do in terms of building capacity. So we said, I can't not include $15 million or so every year in our rate structure to pay for the other laterals that are not in North Hartford that someone else is going to want as well. I got to do it. I mean, I know Deep says, well, we won't pay for it. And I said, okay, but I have to include it. And, I, and again, my line was, it's not going to cost a penny more than what we proposed. So fast forward, I won't get into these except to say there's an awful lot of work that went into getting to where we are, right? And basically, all of these scenarios are exactly that. 
these scenarios are basically we're saying to deep everything you know if you you can barely see the dotted line but here's our dotted line and all of these scenarios were above our dotted line and we said you got to give us more grant money they finally came down this is where the stretch the last two weeks where basically they said we said look if you give us the 50 percent grant for everything um all of our towns, not just Hartford, but all of our towns, 50% 50, 50 grant for the rehab work and 50% grant for the private property, we could actually see a sh show a reduction in the rate for all of our customers. But if you don't, then we're up here. And then they said, well, they let us push the tunnel to 2058. That helped a little bit. But it's still, we're still here. We're still here. We're still above the line. And, we're, and our, again, our answer to, the, to everyone is no, it's unacceptable. So that's where we started talking about, all right, let's shift this $300 million for 10 years. And um, they agreed to that. And then we finally settled on this. So this is our line that, that everyone approved. And this is basically our $4.25 that goes up to uh, $7.25 uh, up through 2032. And then it bumps up to... Uh, 2048 bumps up to nine dollars and change that's what was approved and so we said how are we going to do this so we're going to spend in North Hartford and we're going to be very busy for four years and what's going to happen is we're going to be doing all that free lateral work it's going to be all part of the clean water surcharge everyone is going to be paying for that but there's going to as you know there's going to be an expectation that everybody else is going to get that uh, as well so Realistically, we'll be so busy in Hartford doing this work, we're going to be ramping up in our other towns. And so what we've proposed is instead of spending $15 million every year like we're doing in North Hartford, practically we're only going to get to $2 million in the first two years. We'll bump up to three, we'll bump up to five, and then we'll be spending $8 million thereafter. And so that would be just on private property work for our towns. We think this is a realistic uh, schedule. The process, DEEP has, um, as of, I think, uh, yeah, uh, Friday, it might have been Friday, um, they had approved in concept what we've been proposing. We've been back and forth. As you know, I sent a letter, uh, email to the commissioner of, of DEEP. You all received that. Um, so we do have a, um, a uh, informal commitment. The process would be, I'm presenting this to you tonight. The process would be I would finalize this in letter format, which would be almost identical to the email with some more specifics. And then DEEP would basically revise our consent order to include all of these details about changing schedules and about the, the change in the grant uh, and loan that they're proposing. Um, and they have said they've committed to the 50% uh, the grant for the private property work. They've committed to the 50% grant for the rehab work, so lining sewers in the streets. They only pay 20% typically. And they have said they look at this as a pilot. They believe that, and I do believe, the MDC has been, I've said this before, we're the first ones in New England that have a, um, approval for an integrated plan. We're very dynamic here. I think that this is going to change the minds of the regulators in Hartford and, in, and in, in, across the EPA. I think they're going to start to realize that when we see the significant benefits to the community, the significant benefits to their, their goal of CSOs, they're going to start to realize that this is really the way the clean water project should move forward in the future not building big tunnels. Now, what do we do? And the, the goal would be, and we've said this to them, you know, one thing they're very concerned about is you got all these big tunnels we paid $600 million for, what are you gonna do with them later? Well, um, that's a good point. But if, if we said in, just take this area as an example, so if you're looking at uh, contract four, this is what, this is, we have uh, five overflows or six overflows on whether, uh, Franklin. Franklin Avenue, thank you, that overflow to the Lesville Cove. So the goal is pick those overflows up and dump them into the tunnel, right? But if our logic is, 
Let's do the same thing we're doing in North Hartford. Let's, let's spend that $120 million and let's remove the stormwater so it doesn't overflow. Then what we can do is we can start using these tunnels as actually storm tunnels and use them to understand the logic that we talked about. You get August 19th, 2021, a 244 year storm. And, and the same thing, when this goes to West Hartford, maybe the logic is as the town starts putting in infrastructure for storm, they bring their storm water to the tunnel. And all of a sudden your tunnel becomes, yeah, you still have CSO in it and you still have fresh storm water in it. So it still is a CSO. You only need one gallon of water to a million gallons of storm and it's a CSO. Right, Gary? <laughs> so, so, so it is, and it will always be a CSO tunnel, but eventually, over time, you start to remove those CSOs. And that's what happened on Gully Brook. The Gully Brook used to have dry weather and CSO flows to the Gully Brook. It was a brook. We had to treat the entire brook because it, there was CSOs in it. So, you know, the ultimate goal is we want to spend the money where it's going to do the most good for the community and for these, the regulators. Let's spend $120 million separating Franklin Avenue. It won't be for 10 years, but it's better than spending $120 million for this little pipe right here. And then in 20 years, you have to spend $120 million on Franklin Avenue to replace pipes. Um, so I'm, I'm just, uh, that's it. I, I just wanted the board to understand the process where we are. Uh, I'm expecting, I know the chairman's expecting that we're going to write these letters back and forth to each other. The, the deep's going to send us a new uh, consent order. But just like in September, the deep sent us a consent order approved, but the board still has to approve it. So the board, we would expect the board to approve whatever deep gives to us, and we're expecting it to be exactly this. Uh, and we would bring that to uh, most likely the July meeting. Uh, and if we needed a, separate, uh, a special meeting, I don't think we do. I think by the time we get everything, we still have a lot of due diligence to do, to do on the procurement side, just getting contractors in place uh, to do this private property work. We've been meeting with a number of different organizations through Hartford to try and build that capacity. The Hartford, um, Hartford High School, the laborers unions, uh, um, uh, we've met with our commissioners from Hartford to get their input. Uh, there's been a lot of work done, and we think it's going to be a very successful program. So, questions? Mr. Chairman? <clears throat> uh, Mr. Salemi, Commissioner Salemi. Thank you. Commissioner Salemi here. Scott, just a um, quick question. So, um, there's a lot of work in the last few weeks, yeah. obviously. But where do we stand with the uh, Park River conduit now and, you know, what, what we were working on with the city of Hartford with that? I mean, are we doing the study? Is there a study ongoing now or is there is that still in the future or, or in where we stand with that? Uh, Chris Stone. If I might, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris Stone, District Council. Uh, as you know, we've been working on a memorandum of understanding with the city of Hartford to divide up responsibilities and costs for uh, the uh, Park River, North Branch of the Park River study. Uh, that memorandum has been finalized. We signed it a, a week or so ago. Uh, the city, just tonight, uh, through uh, Commissioner Stuber, thank you very much, delivered the signed, uh, two signed originals uh, from the city of Hartford. So that's on its way. It'll go over to DEEP. We've already uh, uh, done the preliminary work with DEEP to, <coughs> to uh, uh, assign a, a task order to it, assign a, a design team or a, a, an engineering team to perform the work. Deep's committed to pay, excuse me, one half of the total expenses estimated to be, Scott, I think it's 900 about $900,000. So they've agreed to pay half of have a grant through the uh, clean water project or clean water uh, uh, funds that we have to pay for one quarter, and the city of Hartford has agreed to pay for the other quarter. So that uh, should be um, final, the, the document should be finalized uh, in short order, and then uh, it's CDM that's doing the work, and they anticipate a uh, turnaround time of between 12 and 18 months. Uh, I just want to, just, just to make sure you understand my, part of what my question is about. So, Scott, what you described what we're going to use the, the tunnel, we're, we're not using it for anything different, but you're just suggesting that 
for the big tunnel that we can get more stormwater in it, or that when we do some separations in the south end of Hartford, we can use the tunnel. But the tunnel, and the tunnel is the dead end. It's got to get pumped into the river all the time, 100% of the time. And the Park River conduit in the flood stage of Connecticut River has got to get pumped over the dike. Uh, I don't know what actual stage is that it can't flow into the river. But we're going to be adding, uh, if we separate the sewers in the north end, we're going to be adding stormwater to the Park River it's a conduit. So that's, that's got to be part of the study, too, that, you know, what, what additional capacity is there? And if West Hartford can, goes forward with separating or getting the, the groundwater out of uh, our sewers, it's got to go somewhere. And I assume it's going into Trout Brook, and Trout Brook winds up at the, at the conduit in, in the same way. So there's additional, um, there's additional capacity that's needed for the, to pump it up over the dike when, when it gets there. But, Maybe yeah, you can just explain yes. a little bit of that. Too. Thank you, if I will, uh, uh, Scott Chelson. So, so I, and I've said this a, a, a lot, and I, I'll say it again. Um, the, so the drainage study, uh, the reason why it's important is because the way in which you achieve the elimination of the overflows to the North Branch of Park River is through separation. So there's a lot of uh, monitoring of the of the pipes and where the water is coming from to understand how much you're going to remove and how much you need re, need to remove to do to achieve that goal, right? Um, so to Commissioner Slummy's point, um, that's one component of it. And then the stormwater that you do separate needs to go to the north branch of the Park River, which is a river. Um, the one thing that I want this board to understand is, although we need that. And although we need that water body to dump our water in, the North Branch of the Park River needs to be dredged aside from that issue, right? There's, there's flooding occurring uh, within the Blue Hills Granby area as we speak, not just because of our issues, but because of uh, the, the ability for that water to get out of the community. And it could be as much as the railroad, the railroad uh, um, structure acts as a dam, right? It, it, the water can't flow towards the river. It, it, it hits the, 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 the railroad, and that's where you have seven feet of water uh, in people's backyards, that homes that are up against the, the railroad. The, the, so there's lots of reasons why the river needs to be dredged, in addition to the MDC's need to dump clean stormwater into this river. The challenge, what we're going to have is, and everything we've talked about here, uh, does not include two things. It doesn't include 50%. $50 million to dredge the river. That's not part of this, this answer, right? Because we've always said uh, it's the city's responsibility to dredge that, not the MDC. So we don't have that in our budget. The challenge is going to be is that if, we, if the river is not dredged, then we're going to have a problem, right? We've still got to get our water out of the city and into the river. So the only solution might include pumping it. So if you have to build a hundred million dollar pump station to pump this stormwater into the river, you're going to create two problems. One, I guarantee you Deep's going to say the same thing they said on the private property work. They're going to say that's not CSO related, that's stormwater related. We don't fund stormwater related, so the hundred million dollars is going to have to be paid for by either Avalorm or by the clean water surcharge with zero grant. So that's a big hit. Right, so that 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 the graph I showed you will go through the roof with, with that with that with that hundred million dollars, um, and so that's the challenge we're going to be focused with. When this study's done in 18 months, we're going to need an answer. We're going to either need the city to step up, the feds to step up, the state to step up. Somebody's going to have to step up, or some combination, or some combination. But but there's going to need to be a solution. The other problem, if you do do a pump station and the ri river is not dredged, uh, we've heard from some of the NRZ's you know, um, gentlemen on Scarborough, um, you know, th there's a consequence to not dredging the river. There's localized flooding as we speak because of the trees that fall in the river that need to be cleared. A tree acts like a dam, right? You have multiple trees falling down. They act like a dam. They need to be cleared so the water can flow through. Um, so there's a lot to be done on this topic. I just want to be clear that, that all of that is not part of this graph. 
And so that's something that's going to have to be discussed. And we don't want to wait 18 months to discuss it because when you wait 18 months and then we're ready to go, you know, we're, we're starting planning our designs and all those good things and we need to understand, are you pumping this or aren't you? Because if you're pumping it, as you know, Commissioner Slummy, you can put the pipe a little sh uh, shallower in the, in the ground. You don't have to, you don't use, need gravity, right? So, so you, you, we've got to understand this stuff and we can't wait to the end of, of, the, uh, of the, the, uh, the drainage study to, to make these decisions. A very, very important discussion. Um, but if you pump more water into that water body, the north branch of the Park River, without dredging it, you're going to create local, more localized flooding uh, than there is right now. Well, and that, that was my question. And so, and you said CDM, is, we have CDM working on, on that, both on the tunnel and on other stuff. And I understand that they're working for West Hartford as well. I, Correct. I, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I know that you've said that, uh, you know, on a dry day, we get uh, 8 million gallons from West Hartford, and on a wet day, we get 80 million gallons. Yep. So some of the 72 million gallons of stormwater or, or groundwater in West Hartford, it's got to go somewhere. If it winds up in the in the Park River, and the same thing, it's a capacity issue that, you know, that, that we've got to consider, and maybe down the road, but all of this stuff is down the road somewhere. Yeah. So, the, so until we get solid in point where the capacity has got to be considered, uh, I, I think, uh, it, whether we need another way, like you said, to pump stuff to the river, pump the stormwater to the river, or whether the Park River is going to be able to handle this in the future together with the tunnel, if we can redirect some of the stormwater to our big tunnel, right. uh, whether or not that can, that can, you know, solve the problem. So. It is a big problem, and I appreciate yeah. that you guys have uh, really taken some, you know, in a very short period of time, sort of got a, a focus on the, you know, strategic interests of, of getting this done and instead of just a, you know, a sort of technical and, and you know, uh, the issues that, that we had to deal with. You know, you're going to have to have that plan in place before we start spending hundreds of millions of dollars with, with no place to go afterwards right. with the water. So. Thank you, Scott. Yep. Uh, Commissioner Patel. Some of the questions, my quest, questions are answered in this discussion. However, this affects to practically every town. Mm -hmm. In my town, state is right now doing a lot of drainage work on their road. And ultimately, that water goes into natural stream wherever it is. No, nobody probably is addressing what it will have the impact, where that water will be accumulating, is it clear enough or not, and that should be part of it. And that's what brings to that question of <coughs> us starting to promote some type of stormwater authority. Mm -hmm. If, if I may, Commissioner, so I was asked to speak at the inaugural uh, Investors um, uh, Expo um, conference a lot two weeks ago, um, re and it was uh, set up by the Treasurer's Office, uh, State of Connecticut, and the Governor's Office. And the whole concept of the of the presentation, there was a number of different presentations. I was with uh, uh, DEP and some others, um, the Green Bank. And one of the one of the goals of the presentation was to really to lure uh, for Bob to lure investors. Like, why would I want to invest? in bonds sold by the state of Connecticut. What, you know, why? What, 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 what do you have at Connecticut that, that others don't? And um, the one thing that I tried to iterate is exactly what we're talking about here, is that communities that understand this stormwater issue, when, in my opinion, the old regulatory mind is talking about tunnels and collecting CSOs, we're talking about getting the stormwater out. The, the, the communities like Hartford and the state like Hartford, if we start to build, to your point, Commissioner, a real understanding of stormwater um, authorities, to really start to focus on stormwater, not CSOs, not backups and basements, but actually get the stormwater out, you'll solve all these problems that we're trying to, we're trying to solve right now. And, um, I really think the communities that do that and invest in that are going to be the communities that, that people want to invest in. 
because a lot of these investors are looking for green investment. They want to know that their communities are doing something to save the environment. And um, I really think that, I think, I think Hartford and our towns, I understand, you know, East Hartford's a perfect example. They're not getting any benefit for the Clean Water Project, but East Hartford always supports the Clean Water Project. And the reason why is, Whatever we spend in Hartford is going to be, they're going to pay for it under the clean water surcharge or the Avalorum. So it's in our towns, all of our towns, best interest to support this stormwater, get the stormwater out. Um, and we'll start to see a reduction in operation costs and capital investment uh, and improvement. And we'll start to see development come to our community because of it. Further questions? Commissioner? So we are talking about the private property owners, right? So what would be the liability going forward for each private property owner? For example, four or five years down the road, there's a breakage in the pipe and all that stuff, right? And then also we are talking about existing versus, you know, new connections. So what, who pays for the, you know, if there's a new connection coming in, who would be paying for that? You're, right. you're talking uh, about the lateral. Yeah. The laterals, right. So what we've tried to do, and I know there's a lot of comments, and it's a very difficult thing to do. Right now, our ordinances are very clear that the property owner is liable, responsible for the, the service from the house all the way to the main. Uh, and they, they pay for that, right, when, they, when it's built. And we want to keep that liability on this process, even though we're going to provide up to $10,000, we want to provide, keep all of that liability with the homeowner. So we've been very, we've tried to do a, a very good job in trying to write that into the ordinance. Um, the, to your question, everyone who has a, um, everyone who is in those shaded areas that we're lining, so for example, if we went into West Hartford or Wethersfield or Newington, and we started lining the mainline sewers in those towns, we'd do the same thing that we're doing up in North Hartford. We'd line the laterals to the houses as well. Um, if someone in, uh, in uh, West Hartford, Newington, Wethersfield, or East Hartford, they had a lateral that was collapsing, they would call us up, we would inspect it, we would make sure that it was actually, if it was an imminent failure, it would get replaced. And it would be done by a private contractor working directly with the homeowner and we would reimburse them that up to $10,000. Same, you know, so we want to push this onto the liability of the homeowner. Um, but there will be a number of people who say, listen, we have this program. Uh, I want mine replaced, and they'll get on a list, just like the backwater valve, and we'll make sure that, that we get to them as quickly as we can. But again, we don't want to take the liability um, because um, because we're gonna we're gonna reimburse them. So there's a lot to work out, Commissioner, but we are gonna make sure that um, that we get to everybody. And there's gonna be some laterals that people say, I want mine replaced. I'm gonna say that's great, but it's it's in really good shape and. We'll put you on the list and we'll get to it when, when, when we can. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a fine line about taking responsibility for any future failure and any future roots and backup uh, and, paying for a, and paying for a new lateral. Commissioner Patel, are you finished? Um, uh, Commissioner Drake. Instead of getting into private laterals, would, would it be easier if the deep just gave the city of Hartford a big grant, let them fix their problem, and we should stay away from it? Well, we, we had that, so we had that discussion with Deep, and um, you know, the, the challenge Deep had uh, with this uh, is that it's, uh, the private property work is, 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 is taboo in terms of the Clean Water Project, right? But that's gonna happen. Right, so, so, so the, 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 they could have given, and we asked for that, that was one of those scenarios up there, give us, enough grant money so we can pay for 100% of the laterals, not 50%. That's but when we, as soon as we start paying for 50%, and, uh, everybody... I'm going to go back to my question. We're not even involved anymore. Right. Deep but they wouldn't... The reference says, here's 150 million dollars. But they wouldn't. They wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't no. Why, yeah. they, could, they felt that they, they could not give us all of that money because there's other towns and there's other priorities. Um, so the answer was they couldn't give us that money. So that's why we ran all these different scenarios. But we did ask. First scenario was give us the 150 million, and we're good, and we'll just do what we uh, 
what you want us to do, and, uh, and it won't cost anyone in the other seven towns or Hartford a penny. But they well, would. Just, just remember how this started off when we went to the meeting on North Main Street, and uh, Senator Blumenthal was there, and then all of a sudden EPA showed up, and Deep showed up, and everybody was talking, EPA was talking about the possibility of doing this and being a part of it, until they turned around and realized that their national uh, position is that they don't get involved in private property on stormwater. And uh, in 1978, they made that decision and they eliminated any funding. We used to get 50, uh, 80% to, to, from the feds in 20. And all of a sudden, their attitude changed. You didn't see them at the, the meetings after that because they looked at the economics of where it was going. It's a tough situation. Um, Commissioner Johnson. Uh, thank you. Uh, question um, on the, when you do the private property rehab to the building, what happens to the sump pump or roof leaders that, that may included. be there? Are they taken out completely redirected? Is there an infrastructure for that water to go somewhere? Yeah, good, good question, Chris. Scott Shelson. So uh, every house is different. Every town is different. And w that's why we do building assessments. We have to actually assess each house almost on its own merits, right? The, the in concept, um, we are doing what we call belts and suspenders. So those five projects, for example, um, although those five projects we're proposing, um, those, that new storm pipe that we build, or we use the old pipe for the storm pipe and a new sewer pipe, um, those will go to an outfall, uh, uh, which is not a CSO. So therefore, it's, it's going directly to a, a stormwater outfall, Gully Brook or whatever it might be. However, um, we still worry about belts and suspenders because, uh, for example, you might have a circumstance where you have th the storm system overwhelmed and now you have a sump pump that's connected to the storm system of the house. So we pipe it in such a way that uh, we put an air gap in so that the rain leaders coming off the house will overflow outside and not inside, and the sump pump will have a check valve on it. So there's ways in which we plummet, but unfortunately, we have to assess every home differently because of the way it's plumbed. Right, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Through? Yes. Uh, further questions? Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Commissioner Payne. Payne. Um, Scott. A lot of talk was about Hartford and stuff, and but there's more than just Hartford that is experiencing mm -hmm. the problems, the yep. same problems. So um, how will you be uh, treating all the other towns in this so that it's equal? Or Correct. How, how will that be done? Yeah, so our initial um, ask was, um, and I clarified this in the email to the commissioner, because since we started this, and I don't remember the date, but it's at least two, three months ago, we were very clear. We said, listen, what we do in North Hartford, we want to do everywhere. Oh, That's okay. outlined under the integrated plan. So if we're going to be doing lining and that kind of stuff in Newington, we want the same 50% grant. We want the same, and that's the way we pay for it. It's costed us $72 million in Hartford, but in order to pay for the $72 million that we, that we didn't budget in, in Hartford, you gotta give us 50% grant, and you gotta give us 50% grant on the private property work everywhere. And it literally wasn't until like uh, a meeting we had with the commissioner uh, two Thursdays ago where they said, Oh no, we're not going to give you 50% grant. We never, you know, that, and there was an implication we were changing the deal, but it wasn't. It was clearly documented in our agreements or our proposal. So, what, but to the credit of Deep, they have said if this works in Hartford and we achieve the, uh, the, the, the I and I removal, the stormwater removal from the sewer pipe, and we are successful to the rate that we think we are, which will be 30%. Um, they have said, we may look at this as the new model. So instead of giving you 20% grant for all of this replacement uh, uh, lining work, we might consider 50% grant and stop focusing on these big tunnels. The, you know who's going to benefit from this? Is going to be the New Haven and Bridgeport. Because seriously, because they haven't done much on their clean water project and we're kind of setting the stage and we will be setting the stage across the country. This, this logic that we're proposing is, is like, um, 
it's, it's, uh, EPA is having a really difficult time understanding it. And it, it, that once we start to prove that our success rate is what we think it will be, they'll start to be more comfortable adopting it as a, as a policy. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, communities uh, that haven't gotten started yet um, in their CSO or SSO programs will start to see the benefits that we've kind of outlined. I, th I think we are uh, setting the stage for, for a different logic of a Clean Water Act. I understand that. Um, but so as you start the work in Hartford, yep. will you also be starting work in West Hartford? So yeah, so if yeah, so if you so if you look at the chart that we um, that we had there, um, I don't know who's still around, but um, we, we what we're proposing to do is the only projects we're really proposing to do uh, defer are those larger <coughs> projects like Contract Four. We had the Homestead Avenue uh, pr project, which was making a pipe bigger. We had another pipe we call NNBI. We were replacing that. Those were excuse me, capacity, but the lining projects, we did push off some of the larger pipe lining projects, but lining in, in, in the other towns, smaller pipe diameter, will be will still be doing that. At the same time as yes. you're doing one. Yes, okay. under phase one, yes. And the uh, second question I had was on the laterals. Is the reason you're addressing the laterals is because you have to get to the house to eliminate the Oh, uh, the overflows into each one of the into the laterals from the stormwater is that the reason why you want to address all the laterals? It seems like it's extremely expensive, and will yeah. this will the laterals be for businesses and homeowners and and um, you know and what determines yep. what so, determines a replacement? Right. So so um, so first question is uh, second question. Was uh, businesses, yes, businesses, anyone who has a lateral to the MDC will be part of this program, okay? The board will have to decide, we already have a replacement program, but the, but the customer pays for it. Uh, we've expended, um, we've collected about $80,000 or expended about $80,000 for those kinds mm -hmm. of programs uh, in the, recently, uh, since 2021. The board might choose we, do you want to go back and, 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 and reimburse people? If you're, going to pay, if, you, if you're going to have a program that pays for a lateral for free, do you want to go back one year, five years, ten years? I don't know. But that's for a board to decide. Uh, but everyone will get, this will be free to everyone. Um, but here's, here's the logic, right? So we know that the stormwater comes from somewhere. The stormwater is coming from different locations based on your town, based on the street. But the majority, you could say 70% of the problem is coming from, the stormwater is coming from infiltrating I&I. &I. Inflow means, we, we call it I&I. &I. Inflow means Lindbrook, all of the streets above Lindbrook oh, are pumping water stormwater into our system because it's coming from the rain lane, it's coming from it. Same thing's happened in Newington, same thing's happened in Weathersville. That's inflow. Infiltration is leaky pipes, it's just cracked pipes. And we have already proven that the, 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 the first six feet, so you got the sewer main in the street, the first six feet of that lateral, we call it the Y, the, the connection point to the main, that first six, six feet we've proven, if you fix the first six feet, you solve 30% of your I and I problems in conjunction with the pipe. You do the main pipe, you can do the six feet. We believe that if we start to provide uh, this benefit to the home directly, one, the issue is everyone's paying for the clean water surcharge and they're not getting a real benefit. The river is, but they're not, their home isn't. So, so the incentive to make sure that we get all, as much of the I and I out is, is replace the lateral all the way. I mean, it's, it's, we're already there, right? So th there's a benefit to the, to the customer. They feel like they're getting something. They're paying $400, $500 a year for the clean water product with little benefit to their home. So there's a benefit there. The, more importantly, it might incentivize West Hartford. It might incentivize Newington and Weathersfield. So you're telling me, as part of this program, if the, if the town puts in a storm pipe in front of 
your home, the MDC will pay for the lateral to go to the house? The answer is yes. Why? Well, because we're already paying for a sump pump. We're already paying for a backwater valve. It, the amount of energy and time it takes to, to do that project uh, in your home, and then we still have the problem. If you sell your home in Newington and you have a backwater valve and you're pumping it to your backyard and you're complaining and people are you're complaining sure about the made. flooding in, in your backyard during the summer and you sell your home and some guy calls up his buddy who's a plumber and says, reconnect it to the MDC, sir. I'm tired of dealing with this. So you never solve the problem. The problem's always there. So our point is just get the problem out of the way. Remove it. And so it will, it, and it has incentivized West Hartford. I've given them credit for it. They've identified $300 million worth of stormwater work. Um, and that's not going to happen in, in 10 years. It's not going to happen in, you know, 15 years. But they've started. They've started. And in conjunction with us, and we're hopeful that Newington and Wethersfield will do the same thing. And we don't have that problem in East Hartford. We don't have the problem in, in Windsor. We don't have the problem in Bloomfield so much. That kind of a problem. But, but it will benefit everyone who's paying for Avalorum and everyone who's paying for the clean water surcharge. Thank you very much. Further questions? I'm sorry, Rick. Uh, Commissioner Bush. Hi, Commissioner Bush. Uh, uh, Scott, uh, thank you for, for that uh, explanation. I more really of a comment than a question. So when I first uh, started my whole journey with the MDC, it was a stormwater issue. and, and my entire concept of what the integrated plan was supposed to be from day one, when I found out it really wasn't that up until recently, and, and your explanation today, I think, was spot on. This is exactly the right journey that the MDC needs to be taking. It's exactly the right direction we need to be moving. It's a big waste of money to be building these giant tunnels. We need to get the water out of the system before it gets into the system. We need to build storm sewers. West Hartford's been definitely very proactive about the storm sewer si um, uh, projects. Um, with CDM Smith, they've, they've spent a lot of money. So I just, I just wanted to basically just thank you and, and appreciate the fact that we're, as a group, moving in that direction. So, thanks. Uh, Commissioner Bill, um, I'm not sure how many homes or this would apply to, but what about those homes or businesses that still have the, the gutters with the downspouts that spit out onto the lawns and the parking lots, and where none of that water goes directly into the system, it may find its way down a driveway into the street, but is that part of the program? It, it, it would be, yes, uh, Scott Jolson. So I know that, um, in Hartford, here's an example. In Hartford, the ordinance are, ordinances are such that you don't want, in certain locations, you don't want that, right? You don't want the water dumping onto a sidewalk in the middle of the winter. That's not good. <laughs> so, um, but where there are areas uh, where, where there's enough grass to absorb that, water and you don't have the complaints from the neighbors, I mean, um, that would be easy to do in Bloomfield. That in, in most cases, it'd be easy to do in Windsor. But it's difficult to do in West Hartford and in, in, in Newington and Wethersfield because uh, the soil type dictates the drainage, right? I mean, um, I've mentioned before, in town of Newington, the groundwater table is nine feet above our sewer pipe. The, the groundwater table is nine foot above our sewer pipe. If you can imagine there's a crack in that pipe, there's going to water going into it. So, uh, yes, the answer is that's a great solution, and we do apply that when we can. Um, but a lot of our towns uh, don't want that to occur, and they have to approve the permits for this, this type of work. They don't want that to occur if it's going to create a nuisance for a neighbor. And we don't want to create the nuisance for the neighbor either. So it, it all depends on you know, the geography of the, of the home and whether or not it can accommodate that. Thank you. Further discussion? Just Commissioner Drake. Commissioner Drake. N not to be selfish, but I want to do whatever's best for everybody, but I am from <laughs> Wednesfield. So what's, what's the impact of delaying that cove work for 10 years? Uh, yeah, so, um, so here's what I, I said to Deep. So um, the project is about $120 million. So that little red line, those, all of those overflows, it, the project is so big, we had to break it up into pieces, right? Um, and the initial plan um, prior to building or prior to making the tunnel larger, 
to make it to accommodate the elimination uh, elimination versus the 18 year storm. We were going to separate Franklin Avenue, and it would be a slow <coughs> transition to get to that elimination. Uh, North Branch of the Park River, in order to get to elimination, is going to take 20 years. That's what we proposed. That's what we proposed initially. That's what we're proposing now. It's a slow transition. But, but here's the answer. The question is, do you want to spend $120 million and achieve contract four and pick a number? 10 years. Take us probably 10 years to build all four of those contracts. You're going to spend $120 million uh, to, to achieve that goal in 10 years, or do you want to um, wait 20 years and achieve the goal over a 20-year period, like you're doing in North Hartford, um, and only spend the 120? And so you're going to spend 120 and 120. You're going to spend 240, because the pipes everywhere are falling apart. We did a presentation uh, during the integrated plan that said, the longer you wait, the system, average age of the life of the system gets older and older and older. So it's all about how, how much can you afford. But yeah, there is a, there is a delay, but it's, it's a 10 year delay. Um, but to be fair to North Hartford, um, I don't think, and I'll be honest, I don't think anybody in North Hartford really cared about the elimination of the overflows to the North Branch of the Park River. It was environmentalists that cared. And what we're suggesting is let's spend the money in the community and help the community. And th eventually, you'll get to the point where you, the, those overflows have been eliminated because of the way in which you achieve it. We're proposing to do the same thing for the Lesfield Cove. It, one last question. If your numbers are right, 30% you think you save, and if you clean up all the laterals in the MDC, would we have not needed the uh, tunnel? When, when we, so yeah, so in 2008, right, so just start in 2004, I wasn't here, but in 2004, uh, the plan to eliminate the overflows to the North Branch of the Park River, ah, sorry, the plan was to eliminate the overflows to Westville Cove. North Branch of the Park River wasn't even mentioned, okay? And then um, in 2004, the definition of elimination was an 18-year storm. So we know what a one-year storm is. We know what a 244-year storm is. We're at a, uh, you know, we're talking about elimination, elimination, which is a 500-year storm. You've got to collect everything and everything forever, right? So in a way in which we were going to do the 10-year, 18-year uh, storm elimination back in, by, defi by defined in 2004 was to separate Franklin Avenue. And then Deep changed their mind and said, no, we, no, sorry, elimination means elimination and and then they added in the, the North Branch of the Park River at that point, 2008. So, so to your, your question is, is um, <clears throat> we're, uh, we're trying to achieve a goal that meets both the community benefit and the, the regulator's benefit without spending twice as much money. I, I don't know what else. And, and two, about the six hundred billion dollar million dollar tunnel, the big one. No, no, no the, 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 what, what, what we're proposing to do is I the tunnel was the no, tunnel. What you're to do if you if you went now backed up and you, and you got all this thirty percent of all the lateral, you take all that together, could you sit back and say, geez, maybe we didn't have to? Again, well, you I'm could you, you could topic. say that, but it's it's like hindsight, right? It's twenty twenty, right? So the, we had regulators telling us to do something, and we had to achieve the goal, and now we've got different regulators, well, a different generation that's willing to consider something different. It, the the an, I'm sorry. The answer is the tunnel will not be wasted, right? The tunnel had to be built because it had to go to West Hartford and Newington. Because EPA, not deep, said you will eliminate these overflows in West Hartford and Newington. So the tunnel got bigger because they wanted us to go to, from an 18-year storm to elimination. But what we will do uh, is that in the future is that as we start to design separation work in Franklin Avenue, we'll start to dump clean stormwater into that tunnel. And it will still be a CSO tunnel. It will still have to treat it. But over time, those CSOs, as West Hartford starts to eliminate their CSOs, they start to build. You know, this is a 50-year plan, right? This is not a, it's not going to happen overnight. And the other issue is, I don't, DEEP never anticipated the environmental change that we're experiencing in such a short 
period of time. They thought that was going to be a much stretched out. And, yeah, and I don't think they expected the, the uh, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't think they expected the, the residents that are paying for this to really understand that it was protecting the river and not protecting their community. Right. So, so that's really the change that was, is a benefit. It's a huge benefit. So. Further questions? Commissioner Patel and then Commissioner Salami. The goal, <coughs> goal of the EPA is to minimize <coughs> the number of times your raw sewer you are dumping into water. Correct. And each place depending upon the flow of water that is determined. We used to dump untreated water X number of times of course. in a year. Yep. We have settled to lower it. We are not going to eliminate it. Correct. So if you promise or if anybody understands that this project will eliminate flow in a river all the time, no. Mm. You, you, if you live in a lower area, you will have occasional mix of water. And to, to your point, Commissioner, that's a great point. It, it, just remember this, we're spending four, we were going to spend $4 billion. We spent $1.7 to date, and we'll, we would have spent another $2 billion, $3 billion going forward without this plan. And there's 86 regulators that overflow to a river uh, in Hartford. Only nine of them, only nine, ten, are actually, quote, have to be eliminated. So the other 86 minus nine, 85, is only eliminating a one-year level of control. So when it rains a five-year storm, it's still overflowing. Think about it. You're spending two, four billion dollars to just for a one-year level of control. What we're proposing theoretically should eliminate overflows, right? Because once you take all the stormwater out, what's there to cause an overflow? So our position is a much sounder uh, you know, business model than, than $4 billion for a one-year storm. We're proposing take a much longer time, get the stormwater out, and you'll, you'll get to the achievement of the Clean Water Act, which is elimination of overflows. And new pipes and streets and right. things of that nature. Uh, Commissioner Salimi. Uh, just to uh, comment, just to talk about how some some of the things uh, I know Scott Scott's often referred to this, but some of the things that I think that EPA, DEEP, and even the Army Corps, are some are well intentioned things, but they 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 wind up costing you know uh, additional uh, costs where you know you might not have to do it. But uh, Commissioner Buell mentioned you know what do you do with downspouts? Uh, what do you do with the water from downspouts? So right now. In the community where I live in East Hartford, if you were to build a new home, you would have to build dry wells to put, and, and I didn't, the last five new homes that were built in East Hartford were built right near my house. So, you know, they, they, you'd have to build dry wells. This is to recharge the aquifer. Scott, I'm sure you're you know, yeah. familiar with this. So uh, it adds about $3,000 to the cost of a new home to do this, and they still have to have overflows. It works in East Hartford because it's essentially 20 feet of sand in East Hartford and the water goes away. If you put that same dry well in Newington, it would probably fill up with groundwater instead of discharging the groundwater, yeah. it would fill up with groundwater. So it's not a solution for Hartford and Newington. So you have to find different solutions. So maybe it has to go directly into a storm sewer to get it out of the neighborhood. You know, otherwise it's going to flood the street in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So like Scott says, I think it's... And I guess you're right, Scott. It's, got, it's, it's down to one house at a time or one building at a time. Uh, there's probably no other way you can do that. Uh, but some of the suburban com communities have an easier time dealing with it. So that's further questions. If not, uh, move on to item item nine. I'm sorry, eight. Report from District Council. Again, I apologize. No, you forgot me again. Be short, would you please? Uh, I'm going to be exactly as long as you were, or as short as you were, Scott. No. Uh, Chris Stone, District Council. I will, in fact, be brief. Um, the uh, lawsuits on the landfill continue, uh, uh, one in Superior Court, the other two with the state's claims commissioner. Um, I, I don't see much uh, help on the state side in terms of trying to settle these cases, so I'm sure that they will uh, proceed uh, in, in litigation. Uh, we're hoping that the second case will be released. 
uh, for, from the uh, claims commissioner to Superior Court. We would then combine those two cases. Those both deal with the landfill in Hartford. The third case deals with Buckingham Garage, which is a little different. But uh, consolidate those two cases so we can get them both heard in Superior Court at the same time. So that would that certainly save some, some time and expense. Uh, on the tunnel, uh, not too long ago, uh, we brought to you a proposal or a suggestion that we try to uh, enter into binding arbitration to try to resolve the case. One of the things that you insisted upon, and I think rightfully so, was that the party appointed arbitrators have some expertise and experience in uh, geo geotechnology and in tunnel, uh, tunnel work, actual practical application of uh, tunnel construction. Uh, and, and we wholeheartedly we fought very hard to get that uh, as part of the agreed upon arbitration agreement. The other side was, re was reluctant. Uh, in fact, obstinate in, 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 in that regard and insisted that that's not, that not necessary. We're going to just hire a lawyer and he can talk as he or she can talk his way uh, out of this thing for them. In other words, they didn't want a technical person because, at least in my opinion, arguably, the, te the technology and the technical aspects of the uh, tunnel claims don't match up with what their claim is so, or don't support their claim. So, uh, long story short, uh, those negotiations, even with the in intervention of a federal court magistrate in New Haven, those uh, discussions broke down. We are now talking about uh, non-binding party private mediation, which, you know, listen, as long as we're talking, we'll talk and to try to get this thing resolved, but uh, we're trying to, we're going the mediation route or attempting to. In the meantime, we still have litigation in federal court, which will uh, start uh, start back up again uh, in short order because, again, the arbitration uh, avenue did not work out. There's always a chance. I'm not optimistic as to arbitration. Uh, and again, so long as we keep talking uh, uh, like adults and try to get a, a, a agreed upon resolution uh, amicably through mediation, then uh, we should pursue that, um, that avenue. Again, non-binding mediation. Um, anything that's uh, tentatively resolves uh, obviously would come back to you uh, for consideration. Chris, uh, are you into the merits issue, merits yet? You're, you're still... There, well, I mean... I mean, does, does the, the, not arbitration, the uh, mediation get you into any merit? All discussion? three alternatives would get us into the merits. The arbitration would have gotten us into the merits, not just the, the amount of the claim, but the basis for the claim and the, and the, 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 the uh, um, uh, value of the claim. Uh, mediation will do the same thing, and certainly litigation does the same thing. So at one point, that's a, good, that's a great point. At one point, we were with the Dispute Resolution Board in which we divided up the issue from the, the first issue was the merit of the claim, and if that was resolved in our favor, the case would, at least the, the decision of the DRB Board, which is not binding, uh, but admissible in court, would have ended. Um, if it was decided by the DRB that there was merit to the tunnel claim, then it would go on to the second phase, which was, is referred to as quantum, the amount, the value of the damage claim. Uh, it was bifurcated. Uh, we're not at the DRB anymore. Uh, that, that whole process um, uh, just fell apart with the resignation of, of our uh, appointed uh, member of the DRB, and we were unable to get a third party uh, to take his place. Um, Excuse me a minute, just my computer went out on me. Uh, so uh, on Colebrook, uh, despite some bumps along the road over the past uh, three or four weeks, we are on track to get a decision from DPH on our uh, application to abandon the 10 billion gallon storage space, space. I'm very careful, I don't call that a quantity of water because at any given time there's nothing there. So the storage space that, space that we're leasing from the Armored Corps of Engineers, of abandoning that space. Uh, we expect to have a decision from DPH uh, on or about July 20th, depending upon how you count the number of days, but it's 90 days from the submission of our application, which was on April 20th, 2023. So hopefully, and that's an accelerated process for, for um, any, any administrative proceeding and certainly any application before any bureaucracy in the state. So uh, 90 days brings us to August, uh, excuse me, July 20th, plus or minus a day. Um, in the meantime, uh, Scott and I have met with uh, some in interested in environmental groups, um, Save the Sound, in a, uh, I, I don't remember what it's called, what it stands for, but it's 
MCLC, which is, I think it's the Northwest uh, Conservation League, uh, which have, deals in the northwest part of the state. And uh, we've been talking about um, placing a conservation easement over our uh, class through two and class three land that supports no, one and two. I'm sorry, class one and two. Sorry, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Chair, Mr. Chairman. Class one and class two land that support uh, is our watershed land that support the uh, the Colebrook Reservoir and the West Branch, West Branch Reservoir. Um, we've had some preliminary discussions. We met again today, uh, uh, this uh, this morning into the afternoon. There's some. Uh, consideration that they've offered, which I keep, this has not been finalized, but I will certainly bring that to the board uh, in exchange for that conservation easement. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that, uh, and you've been, we've talked about this many times, it's imp uh, impossible to convey or, or to uh, build upon class one land. It's impractical to build or convey class two land. Class three is a different story. Uh, but given the restrictions that are already in place statutorily, it may make some sense uh, to uh, for consideration, this would be one way to get value out of that land to uh, consider a, a conservation easement or environmental restrictive deeds uh, on, on the property. We'll get you the details. Uh, in, in fairness to the environmental groups, they have an obligation to report one way or the other on whether they support or do not support our abandonment petition. They have a deadline, a hard deadline to comment of June 16th, 2023. We may need, in our likelihood, assuming we can reach at least agreement among staff as to the terms, obviously we're not agreeing to anything until it comes here, we may need a special meeting next week of the board. Um, it could be primarily remotely, if it's up to the, the chair, of course. But I have spoken to Chairman DeBell about that, and uh, he's amenable to that. But I, I just wanted to give you a heads up that, that may, we may be asking you, this is a big issue for us, obviously. We've been dealing with this Colbrick issue for some time. This isn't one of the issues that I feel comfortable with, nor does Scott, of asking you to just approve the concept and we'll work out the details later. The details are important, so, and we'd like the board to weigh in. So we may be asking you Monday or Tuesday of next week for, for that special meeting, so please uh, keep... keep uh, Chris, there's, an, there's some other issues involved in it, obviously, but you're optimistic that the next ten, six or eight, ten days you... I, I, I'm optimistic that we can come up with a, a, a recommendation from staff on the terms. I'm also optimistic that as part of the, the exchange would not only be some monetary consideration, but also their support for our petition of a, for abandonment. And as Scott has said many times, uh, what DPH does, and in large part what DEET does, is, is a function of where the environmentalists are. So uh, it would be helpful, needless to say, that that at least those two groups, and perhaps others, maybe the Farmington River Water Shed Association, of which they're associated with, would support our abandonment petition, a petition recognizing that there's nothing there sometimes to, to access public wa a public water supply, and that we have the restrictions on sale, but a uh, statutorily, but an additional restriction, a, con a contractual restriction, is more important to them than what the legislature might do from one year to the next. So. Um, but we'll have that discussion uh, in all likelihood next uh, Monday or, or Tuesday. And that would provide us with the ability to go to the federal government, to Congress, it's all, yeah, it's with, all, with, exactly, the, right, it's with the process. That's a great okay. point. It's one step along the way. Because as you recall, last year we came very close to getting a, an amendment passed in Congress, which would deauthorize the project, allow us to get out of the project, which is our ultimate goal. We're spending upwards of anywhere from four to $900,000 a year for nothing. Uh, uh, no water supply at all, um, and this would allow us to move forward because one of the things that stopped it was DPH's insistence that we go through this, ab this abandonment process. This would have been so, over. This would have been over a long time ago. So thank you for that, Mr. Chair. That's a good point. Um, finally, uh, we have a new member of our uh, legal team over at the in the office. Uh, Joanne Stetson started a couple weeks ago. She's the new office administrator, paralegal. Um, please stop by, or when you're in the building, stop by, see me, and I'll introduce you, or you can just go right on down and introduce, introduce yourself to Joanne. Some of you know her from, uh, uh, she's uh, used to work in East Hartford, she used to work in, in Hartford, and some of you may know her from Weathersfield. She's a used, old, uh, Weathersfield resident from a long time ago. So uh, please stop by and say hello. Uh, she'd love to in introduce herself to you. That's it. Any questions? Okay. Um, Item number nine, Board of Finance consideration of potential action regarding 
A, authorization to issue general obligation bonds not to exceed $90 million, and B, recommendation, uh, reallocation of proceeds of certain general obligation bonds. Um, we can take these both up at the same time. They can be consolidated. Is there any objection to consolidation? No objection? Uh, All right. Bob? Uh, uh, Bob Barron, your chief financial officer. I, I believe Victoria passed out this sheet of paper that has all the pretty colors at the, the top. Uh, this is a project listing of about $85 million uh, worth of projects. The, the resolution that we're asking to be passed is to give me authority to issue general obligation bonds not to exceed 90 million. And, and I'll explain the difference between the 85 and 95, or in the 90 million in just a moment. But the four pages are made up of three sections. You have combined projects at the top, and then you have um, uh, sewer projects, and then you have water projects. There's about $15 million worth of combined projects, 38 million of water projects, 32 million of sewer projects. That's a total of $85 million. The combined projects are those projects that benefit both sewer and water. So it's like our fleet purchases, our common facilities, and the payment for staff that are charged to our capital projects. So if we go past the, oh, I'm sorry. If you go to the far right column, th that's the request that's going to total $85 million. And you'll see about half page on the first page. The total for combined is $14,731,000,000. Uh, $14,731,000. Uh, that's what I rounded up to 15 when I, I introduced it. But I'd like for you to take a, a look at the first project for the sewers. Um, and you can see that it, it was originally authorized in 2023 for water pollution control facilities. And the yellow column is the total appropriation. You gave us permission to borrow and spend up to $7.5 million. And you'll notice in the orange column, we haven't borrowed any money against this project yet. Well, what we do is we work with the, the operations and engineering folks on the third floor and have, us, have them give us their best estimate on what they're going to spend in the next two years. Remember, our tax-exempt general obligation bonds, when we borrow it, we have to spend it within three years. So typically I ask for a forecast of spending for year one and year two. And you'll look at the column right before the, fur uh, before the furthest right column, and you'll see that that estimate for spending in the next two years is $4,025,000. So the authorization for 2023 was seven and a half million, but it looks like we're only gonna spend a little over $4 million in the next two years. So this total on all four pages for all three categories of spend is 85 million. The reason why we asked you for not exceeding 90 million is because Sometimes those two-year forecast spending uh, estimates change between now, our bond rating presentations at the end of June, and our sale in July. And we just want to have that little bit of a, a, a buffer if operations said, listen, our priorities changed a little bit. Instead of $4 million, I'd like $5 million for that project. And so that's the authorization um, uh, in front of you. An interesting thing is that the peach colored request in the far right column, if you add that with the total revenue, the orange column that we've raised thus far, which is grants, loans, bonds, and bond premium, it can't exceed 
the appropriation that you already authorized for us. So that's that's the first agenda item, which is 9A, is uh, uh, our request that you authorize that I can issue no more than $90 million worth of general obligation bonds uh, this summer. Are there any questions? If not, Bob, will you, I'm sorry, uh, <coughs> Commissioner Buell. Uh, thank you. Through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what's involved in uh, interest expense management, given where interest rates are now and the cost of money and funding and so forth? How does that play into this? I, I, I'm, uh, hmm. I'm not sure uh, what your interest expense management with regard to our debt issues. Yeah, the borrowing costs. Uh, right. It, it, um, uh, it really has nothing to do with it. We, we, we're, uh, uh, utilities are a heavily capitalized industry. We have projects that we have to get done. So the, all we do is do our best to provide the money to the operators at the lowest possible interest cost. Now what we found last year is conducting the general obligation bond sale in a competitive format rather than going out there and negotiating with just a few underwriters, the competitive format gave us the lowest interest cost. And we intend on doing a competitive sale again this year. So that's, that's, that's our best attempt just to get the lowest interest possible for the projects we to were told that we need funding for in the next two years. May I? Sure, sure. What is the, is there a, uh, an average maturity on some of these? Uh, they're all 20, well, they're all tw the, the, we issue serial bonds. Um, the, uh, uh, the total request up to $90 million is 20 years, which means we'll have a serial bond due in year one, two, three, all the way through uh, year 20. Um, the large uh, uh, renovation projects uh, are, uh, they are 20 years in length. The uh, fleet, I believe that we have a maturity life for 10, mm -hmm. and IT is the lowest. Uh, we have to capitalize IT projects, but we only do it for five years. One more? Um, somewhat like um, a home with refinancings and so forth. Um, are there any opportunities during the life of the end of these issues, these bonds, to refinance if rates are considerably lower? Absolutely. My first year here, uh, 2021, we did a good number of uh, refundings. And not only refunding these general obligation bonds, but even some of the money we borrow at historically low rates from DEEP and DPH, those 2% uh, loans that we get, we get grants and loans from uh, those organizations, we, we were securing rates less than 2%, so we were even refunding some of those. Thank so you. absolutely, we look every year, we're monitoring every one of our outstanding issues to see if they'll produce positive results in a refunding. Thank you. Further questions? Uh, just one, Bob, you said that this will be a competitive it will. Because there's the option in the uh, document of both op negotiated and, but I think you're right. Right. I, I didn't, I didn't, we, uh, uh, we, we, um, three years ago or so, uh, we, we set up a, a syndicate of uh, underwriters uh, with a uh, lead underwriter and, um, uh, so I, I think the lead underwriter is guaranteed 40% of the sale, and then the other 60% has to be distributed between the junior underwriters. We're not going to use the underwriter syndicate uh, this year, uh, and we're going to go competitive just as we did last year. Okay. So. Further questions? One, one quick, uh, David Drake. Uh, Commissioner Drake. Uh, I see staffing in there. So. Engineering staffing is initially always paid for through our fees and bills that actually we would putting into debt against projects. Yeah. Yes. So if we decide we capitalize no it. projects, people go away. We okay. Fire. 
Okay. No, yeah. seriously. Okay. Yeah. No. We just don't okay. bid them. Well, we're doing two hundred million dollars a year in construction. No, I understand. So no, yeah. no, no, no. I, I, I'm just curious. So, so we're, 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 we're putting debt against each one of those guys, yeah. not paying. Everybody does, right? So yeah. we we don't yeah. we don't. Um, yes, okay. everyone does. Good. Okay. Uh, Bob, you want to do B? No. Sure. That's that's just the uh, reallocation, is it not? Right, and um, so uh, in your agenda package, this is 9B-5. Uh, there's $7.5 million worth of projects um, that, that we have listed at the top that we would like to take money from. So the same authorization we just talked about, you gave me an authorization to go out and borrow money, but guess what? We need to spend it in three years, and it looks like things have changed. I can't spend all the money in three years. Well, I, uh, to maintain our tax-exempt status, we want to take the money that we don't anticipate spending and apply it to a project where we've already spent money. Uh, some of the $90 million that you, you, you're going to hopefully authorize in uh, 9A, uh, some of it are projects that are happening in the next two years, but many of the projects we've already fronted money for. Uh, they were appropriated, we had permission to spend, we spent, and we'll spend up to our annual debt issuance, and there's millions of dollars that have been expended that when we borrow we just pay ourselves back for. Well what this reallocation does is it said, wow, I, I borrowed money for this project, I can't spend it in three years. But you know what? I have other projects I've already spent money on. To maintain my tax exempt status, I'm asking for your permission to take those bonded dollars already borrowed and apply them to projects where I've already spent money. Therefore, uh, spending all the bonded dollars within our three year limit. There's just for full disclosure, there's one other circumstance where we'll ask for a transfer. Is we're allowed to borrow money for projects that we've spent money on only back 18 months. And if we have a project that where I started spending money on it 18 months ago and I haven't borrowed any money yet, I don't want to let those dollars go stale and miss the opportunity to borrow for those projects. So sometimes when we know that there's a project that is probably going to be in a situation where they don't spend all the money I've already borrowed, I ask to have those dollars applied to those older uh, expenditures so I don't lose the opportunity to spend. Because if I don't apply it to them then, next year, we're, that's all going to be pay-go because I already spent the money and it's too old for me to borrow against in the subsequent year um, uh, debt issue. So those are the two situations where we ask for transfers and that's what you have before you in, the, in this document. It's only seven and a half million. Seven, I mean, five, five, yeah, six. Yeah. Yeah. We, we guess really, really good. The, the, the operators and engineers, they, they know what they're going to spend. but. In 2021, we issued $350 million worth of debt. Uh, in 2022, we issued $86.2 million worth of debt. Th this is $7.5 million. We, we just, uh, every year we come to you with our bonding request and then a request to make some of these small transfers to ensure we're complying with our tax exempt rules and we're spending all our money within three years. Are there any further questions? If not, um, on item nine, we've consolidated A and B. Uh, B is the reallocation, which is five, uh, seven million five five six, and A is the ninety million. We're going to treat them as one. All those in favor? I'm sorry. Is there a motion? So moved, Mr. Chairman. And moved and seconded. Further discussion? No discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thanks, Bob. Number 10, don't go away. Uh, Personnel Pension Insurance Committee consideration and potential action regarding 
A, pension investment reallocation. Recommended action, receive the report and adopt the resolution. Uh, again, we can take these together. Uh, B, OPEB, trust investment reallocation. Uh, again, recommended action, receive the report and adopt the resolution. Is there a motion? Combine A and B. Second. We're moved and seconded. Yep. Bob? I'm sorry. Sure, we, we, uh, we hold on, Bob. Sure. Mr. Commi Chairman, Commissioner uh, these Taylor. items were approved uh, in PPNI. Okay. Yeah. Lou, we talked about this in uh, detail at the, the PPNI full meeting right before this, but essentially 10A is just uh, a recommendation for transfers from investment vehicles that have underperformed the target not just in the short term, but over the long term in many of the reporting periods to investment vehicles that have outperformed the target or the index. Uh, we have it in uh, the number one is our large cap equity. It's our largest uh, investment in the total pension portfolio. Represents about 31.4% or 76.6 million of the total portfolio, 244.3 million. In the second recommendation, it is uh, the same type of uh, recommendation moving from something that's been underperforming the uh, target for many periods uh, to an investment that has been outperforming our target, not just for the short term, but uh, we've noticed it for the long term. Uh, I've been here two years, and this is the first reallocation that I've had uh, Dahab uh, make on reallocation in the pension funds. So they don't make the uh, recommendations often, but these two, the, the evidence was really overwhelming on why we should make the move and there's a great deal of detail here that will show you uh, what I kind of summarized quickly. But um, that's, that's what the reinvestment is. The, and then 10B is, is an easy one. Uh, at the end of 2021, in our OPEB, Remember, we, we have two funds. Uh, both of them are fiduciary, someone else's money. The 10A was the pension. That's our promises to pay people their pension checks. And 10B is the OPEB, our promises to provide health care, um, uh, medical and prescription promises to our retirees. So um, uh, 10B is saying, you know what, we started this fund only a few years ago. At the end of 2021, we only had about $800,000 in the fund, and we had a very simple uh, portfolio allocation. 65% was, um, uh, was equity, which is a little riskier, and then 35% uh, was fixed income, a little more steady. But... Um, it, it, it was only enough money to have one investment in each of those categories, equity and fixed income. But now we have close to $7 million in the fund, and uh, Dahab is saying, well, now let's make it a more... Um, uh, uh, robust, uh, diversified portfolio. Let's make your OPEB investments more like your pension investments. And you'll know our pension investments for that equity piece, they have large cap, mid cap, small cap, and international equity investments. And then for the fixed income, uh, What's being reckoned on the pension side, we actually have timber, real estate, and other fixed uh, income vehicles. But the, um, uh, on this OPEB recommendation, they're not recommending timber. They're just doing um, regular real estate. Yeah, real estate and fixed income. So that's essentially what 10B is, is, um, is uh, Back when we didn't have a lot of money, it wasn't a very sophisticated asset allocation um, um, uh, addendum to the policy, but now we're asking to change that um, 
allocation to something that's more pension-like. Just one last comment. In 2021, that pension uh, formulation, that more robust portfolio of assets uh, generated close to 14% return on investment, whereas the current OPEB uh, uh, provided less than 1% return on investments. So um, it, it, it's warranted now that we consider having a more pension-like investment portfolio now that the balances are much bigger in OPEP. Other questions? Okay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Adel. Oh, go ahead, Commissioner Adel. You're Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through you, um, Bob, uh, a couple of things, and not necessarily just related to the OPEB, but in terms of our investment strategy in general. First, um, I think I pointed out at the Board of Finance Committee that um, cash nowadays is getting a pretty robust return, and I'm wondering if we're following up on those. Uh, I know my, our Fidelity clients are earning close to 5% on their cash. That was question number one. Number two is, you know, what's the committee's outlook in terms of the possibility of a recession in the near future, and how are we dealing with that? And then I think um, we had a third part, but I think if you could answer the first two, I would appreciate that. Sure. We, we, we don't have cash as one of the recommended investment vehicles. These, these promises are are good for someone like me, uh, 65 years old this summer, uh, that has another 20 years on the planet. And for a brand new hired employee at 20 years old that has another 65 years on the planet. So these are very long-term liabilities for all the active employees. They take a look at what all our promises are and then bring those liabilities back to time zero and compare them to how much assets you have in the bank. And so um, the portfolio that's been proposed to you tonight is a long-term portfolio that is hoping to maximize results over the long term. 5% um, uh, cash sounds wonderful, particularly compared to the returns for the last couple of years, but uh, investing in cash is not part of this recommendation. Um, Bob, but in, 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 um, in any portfolio, there should be, you know, in an investment portfolio, there should be cash so that if you need to take uh, an action, uh, to buy something, you have to be able to sell something or have cash you know, in order to buy, you know, a certain type of investment, like you were talking about timber versus bonds, et cetera. Um, so, that, you know, just to me, it makes some sense to, to have cash in any one of our long-term investments so that, you know, we can make moves as necessary. We do have cash. Yeah, well, cash. The, um, every year, now, now the, the, we're just to be clear, we're talking about the OPEB fund now. In January 2023, we put $7.9 million worth of uh, cash in uh, uh, deposited in here, uh, in this fund. Um, the, the, we keep a certain amount of cash on hand to pay the anticipated benefits for, for the 12 months, but anything in excess of say four months worth of expenditures, I want actively managed in, in the market. And at the end of every month, if I fall below that four month uh, minimum, uh, we'll just call and remember 65% of our equities completely liquid. Uh, we'll call David uh, at Dahab and say, hey, I need $300,000 sold. It's in our account the next day. So we'll always have a cash balance um, of the, the, my preference is four months worth of, of anticipated expenditures just to make sure we always have money available to pay our bills, uh, but the rest will be actively managed uh, through this recommended portfolio. And the second question, Bob, was uh, what's, your, what's the committee's thoughts on the, the 
portfolio in relation to a possible drop in the market due to uh, a recession? Well, I, I, uh, there will be uh, recessions in the future and there will be booms in the future. I think the uh, this recommended um, asset allocation uh, is a good, sound, uh, long-term investment portfolio for that addresses a long-term liability. We we will have years where we have losses. Uh, 2022 was a loss for the pension fund and for the OPEB fund. So we'll continue to have losses in years or uh, uh, maybe even stretches uh, where the market is not performing. But uh, I think in the last meeting I mentioned in the long haul, I took the money weighted um, return on investment for our pension and our OPEB side by side. I think I had back to 1994 or no, um, shoot. 2000, anyway, it's 10, 10 years, 2014, 2013, and the, um, the, the pension portfolio was returning like 14 and 15 percent for most of those years, and they were positive in eight of the 10 years, but they were negative in two, two of the years. I, I have no doubt that there uh, will be um, a recession in periods of boom, but there's um, it. it uh, that is not how I would recommend uh, making investment decisions for a long-term liability for pension and OPEB. Uh, this this type of structure is. Um, is what is recommended by uh, Dahab, our investment counselors, and which was reviewed by the uh, the PPNI subcommittee, and then confirmed just just in the meeting before this by the full PPNI committee. Further, Thank you. Further questions, uh, Commissioner Bush. Uh, Commissioner Bush, through you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Just stop. does the reallocation reduce the management fees? Is there any uh, consideration for management fees? And does this reallocation change the um, fee structure? Well, the the um, uh, the there, there's a sentence in here. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, it's on page 10B, and you'll see that the uh, where it says resolved, and it gives the 40 percent, 10 percent, five. But the second sentence there said all investments will be index funds except for real estate, and so. Um, it takes into consideration that it'll be the uh, lowest type of management fees in that they'll be indexed funds. Uh, it, um, uh, I had the exact dollars, I can look it up, but we're 70% funded on our pension and um, it's $240 million funded of a $300 million liability, something like that. And many of those are actively managed funds. This, this is uh, $6.7 million. The recommendation is, at least initially, that all those investment categories will be indexed, ex except for real estate. So very low management fees. Bob. Commissioner Taylor. Yes, excuse me. Uh, with regard to the reallocation of the um, equities at the uh, pension fund level, those essentially are going into indexed funds because uh, we've been watching them very, very closely. And the fact of the matter is that we have not been getting the bang for a buck in terms of the actively managed funds. Consequently, you are moving those monies to indexed funds. Uh, I think this is, this is the S&P 500, I think, is uh, where we're moving the equities at the pension level. Exactly. The, the largest piece of our uh, pension fund, I just want to be clear, now we're jumping back to pension. Uh, the largest investment is large cap equity, represents over 31% of the, the whole 
Oh, God, I got all these number, numbers memorized now. It's 76 million of 244 million or something. Um, it's the largest one in the two um, uh, companies that we had the money invested in uh, for multiple reporting periods all the way back to March of 2013 have uh, underperformed the index. And so, uh, there was a vote to move that money into an S&P 500 index fund, and I think it was Fidelity. Uh, yeah. I think Fidelity. they were the yeah the lowest. Uh, many people offer an S&P 500 index fund, but Fidelity had the lowest cost, and so um, that's not un that's not unusual that we would be asking for our low dollar OPEB fund to be all indexed at first because even in our high dollar pension fund, uh, uh, 30 some odd percent of that uh, fund, uh, we're now going to index because we found that it, uh, it outperformed the, uh, the two investment vehicles that we had been in. That was Johnson, yeah. Uh, further questions? If not, uh, item 10, <laughs> A and B uh, has been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> aye. Opposed? Okay. Item 11, Water Bureau consideration and potential action regarding 2023 recreation rates. Recommended action to receive the report and adopt the resolution. Uh, Commissioner Payne. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this was discussed uh, not at our last meeting, but the meeting prior to that, and um, it was uh, uh, the rates were approved uh, unanimously. Thank you. Are, are there any questions? These are the rates. Rates on the um, uh, this. This is up on the voting voting voting, 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 voting rates. Right. If not. All those in favor? Somebody needs to I'm sorry. Aye. 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 Yeah, can we move it? Move it. I'm jumping ahead of it. Is there a motion to adopt? So moved. So moved. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. <laughs> Item 12, consideration and potential action regarding settlement of potential claim. Uh, Victoria Tovar. Possible executive session. Is there an executive session? No, there's no, no, no executive session. Uh, Attorney uh, Myrtle is going to be handling this for us. Jen. Um, good evening. This is um, a claim. It's not yet in litigation. Uh, we received a demand packet from the claimant's attorney. It's the result of a motor vehicle accident from April of last year. Uh, the claimant um, had medicals from an uh, orthopedic doctor and a chiropractor totaling three thousand, approximately three thousand uh, dollars. The recommended settlement is eight thousand dollars. We believe that is um, a, an effective and efficient, um, cost-effective settlement in avoiding litigation. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, is there a motion to adopt the recommendation? So moved. Oh, it's been moved and seconded. Okay. Questions. If just her bills are three thousand, she wants eight. Is that what? Yes. Uh, typical. Yes. It's 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 on the lower side of a settlement oh. for these types of cases. Is she, is she one of our employees, or is she somebody? No, else? she's a she's a private citizen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. Opposed. Okay. And 13, Commission's request for future uh, agenda items. Uh, opportunity for general public comments. Judy Allen, West Hartford. I just want to make an observation that um, all the, the great things you're talking about with being able to uh, change the integrated plan and the great things you're going to be able to do in offering these um, private property 
solutions would not have been possible were it not for the advocacy and the persistence of the residents and businesses in North Hartford. Um, I wish it didn't have to always be this way, but they did a great job in advocating for themselves um, and they deserve recognition for that. Further comments? Further Thank you, good evening. Um, my name is Bridget Prince. Um, thank you, Ms. Judy, for that comment. I, I wanted to, I'm um, sitting in the meeting, I'm glad I'm here, but I wanted to clarify a couple things. I've been listening to um, all the commissioners and I think there's um, a little bit of confusion. Um, I don't even live in Hartford. I live in East Hartford, so we don't experience the sewage overflows like the North End of Hartford. But this is exactly why um, everything has come to a head and why it's being resolved in this manner. Because separate from the groundwater, separate from the storm waters, the North End of Hartford specifically has been experiencing sewage overflows, which could have been prevented and could have been resolved uh, years ago. And it just came to a head and it's still continuing. So I really wanted to give clarification as to why the North End of Hartford has been the focus. Um, Chairman DeBella, uh, you, you mentioned about the meetings with the, when the EPA came in January and February, it did just to, and Senator, you said Senator Blumenthal came and then EPA showed up and DEEP showed up. That's not exactly how it happened. EPA and DEEP uh, had litigation against the MDC uh, for several years and this is how come they showed up because it has been an issue of environmental racism, environmental injustice because as it has been proven, again the North and the Hartford which is predominantly black has been experiencing sewage overflows where you have human waste going into their properties. So this is why we are here today talking about it and I wish, you know, everybody would get the same service because everybody deserves the same service because every district pays the ad valorem which should cover sewage, sewage repairs and laterals and everything else. But this is specifically why the MDC is addressing the North and the Hartford because we have, we have water coming in there, we have groundwater, we have uh, stormwater in East Hartford, West Hartford, Newington, Farmington, Glastonbury, wherever else, but in the North End of Hartford, they not only have stormwater, they have raw sewage going into the basement. So this is, this is why this is happening. Thank you. They have it in West Hartford too. <laughs> Further comments? No. Don't, don't get it. Good evening, commissioners, commissioners, and good evening, chairman and staff and attorneys. My name is Cynthia Jennings, and I do live in North Hartford. And um, I've been involved with North Hartford issues for many, many years. It's been well over 30 years. And I think that it's critical that, um, well, first of all, I am going to comment on some of the promises that were made regarding this whole issue at the Hartford City Council meeting last week, at the, um, the meeting of the whole. Okay, and one of the things that was, what stood out in my mind is that you were talking about bringing in 30% of minority contractors, not minority contractors, Hartford residents to work on some of the projects. I think that is critical. I think that those individuals who've been cut out in North Hartford have been cut out for many years. There's been redlining essentially and other issues that have kept our people from going to work. I think not only do we need to talk about the residents, we need to address the issues of the minority contractors that are in Hartford that have been neglected from so many issues. And I'm asking that all the promises that you made to the Hartford City Council, that you take very careful consideration and reach and meet those promises. Um, those promises are critical to the survival, the economic survival of the people in that community. So I thank you for what you're doing. 
I'm, I appreciate those individuals that are commissioners that are supporting this whole F, um, event. And I also want to say that if it wasn't for the people in North Hartford standing firm and losing homes and, and being faced with illnesses that they got from the raw sewage and from the, um, the, from the mold and, 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 and other issues that created health problems. And I'm saying that because I am one of those people that faced those issues. So I'm not talking about other people. I'm talking about myself, my family members, my friends, my community. So I think it's very important that you take seriously every promise that you made to North Hartford and that you live up to it. And thank you very much. Further public comment? If not, uh, the proper motion of adjournment is in so is your motion. It's been moved. Uh, without objection, we stand uh, adjourned.